Hi, I'm Linda Lynch with the League of Women Voters, and we're really happy today to be able to welcome Congressman DeFazio. I have a couple of announcements first. I understand that there is a fire sale going over there by the entrance on uh, League of Women Voters t-shirts <laughs> for, for the low, low price of $12.50, $12.50. So they have been marked down dramatically. Um, there's a variety of sizes and styles, so go check them out. Uh, uh, it kind of has a great message about voting by mail, it, you know, like mark it, stamp it, mail it. <laughs> it's on the back, so it's kind of a simple message about how easy it is to vote. I also want to say, announce the new edition of They Represent You, hot off the press, and there are some, Rhonda has some copies at that same table where you could also buy a t-shirt. And they will, members will probably get them in the mail, uh, not with this um, mailing, but maybe next month. Well, we'll see. We'll see how heavy the envelope is. Um, so you can pick some, especially if you're not a member and you want one, pick one up today. There's, um, we have quite a few here, so feel free. So it's a very exciting thing for me to be able to introduce our congressman. And um, when I did this once before, I had this honor only once before, I seriously wrote a lot of notes uh, and drew the applause line when I said he is the, uh, only, the person who served the longest in Congress of anyone that Oregon has elected to Congress. But I thought today, there's kind of a little bit of a different picture to paint about how, how we get to where we are today. Um, P Peter worked for uh, Congressman Jim Weaver before he uh, became a county commissioner and a member of Congress himself, and he um, kind of rose to public attention in 1981 when he became the uh, lead plaintiff in a lawsuit, DeFazio versus the Washington Public Power Supply System. Whoops. So. I was just think, I, I was thinking about that, and I went back and I looked at the stories on the whoops, and I th how I remember all that, and all the people who came and went, and the number of Springfield Utility Board managers, and how Springfield was different than other places, and, and who were also suing whoops, or who were benefiting or losing. So I just thought of that, and then as time has gone by, here it took all the way to January 2019 for him to become chair of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. So I just wanna say it took 38 years and it's been a long time and we are thrilled. Uh, I sent a note to someone, to a friend in Washington DC, I forwarded the Register Guard article and basically said, that didn't take too long. <laughs> so, but it did, but we're happy we're here now and I'd like to introduce Congressman Peter DeFazio, chair of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. I can move around. I, I'll talk from here, and then when we start taking questions, I'll use the other one. Oh, well, thanks, Linda. You know, the story, the true story of Whoops has, has never been told. A lot of people came to interview me and say they were going to write the book, um, the, and the only book that got written really was not very conclusive. There were just some extraordinary uh, events in, in that. It was, at the time, the largest uh, public bond default in the history of the United States, obviously, subsequently a, eclipsed by the uh, savings and loan crisis and then by the Wall Street crash in 2008. But at the time, it was a really big deal. And uh, there was, uh, it, it's a long story, and I, I won't go into it now, but, but there, there were some extraordinary events, but I'll just relate to, uh, we're in discovery, and I have a, a local attorney from Springfield, Bob Ackerman, is lead counsel, and then we got um, Martha, uh, Martha Walters, uh, from and she was working for a, a larger firm, but she was representing the, the, the grand city of Drain, and uh, who was also a participant in Whoops. And um, we were doing discovery, and they go up to the Whoops headquarters, and they had their in those days file cabinets in a room about the size of a gymnasium, and they said, "Well, just go right ahead, but there's no index." Uh, but ultimately, we found that all of the opinions by lawyers representing PUDs, municipals, and co-ops 
were identical. And of course, they're all covered by different laws in Oregon. So how could they all be identical? And they were all signed off on by... So there were a whole lot of issues about what, uh, how this had all come forward. And um, you know, the, the ultimate decision that we won in the circuit court, uh, Judge Woodward uh, shocked the heck out of people. I, the head lawyer for, whoops, I think passed out during the call. Uh, when the judge announced the, uh, his preliminary ruling. And, uh, you know, subsequently, uh, you know, the Supreme Court preempted the case on a, on a Friday, and it was going to be heard in the appeals court on Monday, and then uh, quickly rendered an opinion, which ultimately whitewashed the whole thing. There were ultimately, there were a lot of lawyers in Oregon who probably would have been disbarred uh, had that gone forward. That story's never been told. The other one was the chief counsel uh, for whoops, uh, their chief bond counsel in New York, uh, who also was, who had written this opinion that everybody used, uh, when they went to depose him, he was under psychiatric care and couldn't be interviewed. Uh, so the, the resolution ultimately was we get out from under the debt, but the path there was very crooked, uh, to put it mildly. So thanks for reminding me of that. I, I, I've, I've got a I've got to do, uh, I actually, I got Bob Ackerman on tape on a good part of the story, and I, I should do my own version, too. Uh, Linda also reminded me something else, and apparently sometimes when I speak, it makes a difference. <laughs> and uh, she said that uh, you've just, uh, the, the league has just rendered uh, this report uh, on hard rock mining in Oregon. And it, this has been something of a, a cause with me since I got to Congress. We're living under uh, the... Uh, Mining Act of 1872, Ulysses S. Grant was president of the United States. We had this vast wasteland in the West that was unsettled and we wanted to encourage it, people to move there. Uh, so a law was written that basically gave away precious mineral rights uh, for virtually nothing. Uh, and, uh, but that unfortunately prevails till today. Uh, in 2019, twice in the House we passed hard rock mining reform and twice it was blocked in the Senate. I expect we may pass it again in this Congress, It'll probably meet the same state in the Senate. Uh, hopefully after the next election we can change that. But, um, you know, it's a scandal both in terms of the impacts on the environment, uh, and it's a scandal in terms of us giving away tens of billions of dollars of uh, depletable, precious assets for nothing to foreign corporations for the most part. Uh, who, uh, who are engaged in mining, and there's no other nation on earth that allows this. Uh, everybody else charges royalties, and that's a key part of the reform, in addition to imposing environmental rules and bonding, because I have a, I have a mine that still isn't cleaned up, in a, and there's two of them in my district that are on the Superfund site, and I don't know when we'll ever get them cleaned up, because the companies, you know, were shell companies that went bankrupt, and they just left a total mess, so, and they're polluting rivers. So, uh, this, I'm going to look forward to reading this report, and because of things we can do within the state, too, uh, to deal with some of these abuses. Well, let me uh, just, uh, what I've been doing this week, and uh, I'm trying to, and I'm sure the League will be interested in this, too, although you've taken positions, certainly, before on, on health care. Uh, I've been going around uh, reminding uh, people uh, of where we were before the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, where we are today and where we might be in the not too distant future, dependent upon a court decision. Uh, and, you know, just uh, recently the Trump administration uh, took an extraordinary position as uh, the, he ordered the Justice Department uh, to join uh, litigants in Texas uh, to declare the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional and repeal it in its entirety. Uh, and he said, don't worry, uh, we're going to be the party of health care, we'll have a better plan. Uh, and then Mitch McConnell said, uh-uh, we're not working on that. So <clears throat> now he's saying that uh, he will have a great plan after the election that will be better than what we have today. Uh, and I, you know, that just sort of triggered something in my mind. I thought, Richard Milhouse Nixon planned to end the war in Vietnam. Trust me, we elected him. I didn't, but people elected him. Uh, and uh, he didn't have a plan to end the war, and it didn't end until his second term. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think we should uh, be betting on that. I, but I, we need to remind people, and in, in, in when I've done these uh, town halls, I've had experts there, I mean, particularly the people who work in uh, community, uh, you know, CCOs, community centers, 
uh, federally qualified uh, health centers, uh, the county people, and the numbers are extraordinary. In Benton County yesterday, no, in Lane County uh, yesterday, I was in Benton also, uh, the uh, uninsured rate uh, used to be 16% uh, in Lane County, it's now four. So uh, that's a lot of people. And in my district, uh, the congressional, my fourth congressional district, which is rather large, sprawling, uh, all the way down to the California border and up to Sweet Home, uh, we, I have the fifth largest number of people on expanded Medicaid of the 435 districts in the United States. Now, that's not percent, fifth absolute number. Uh, I mean, my district is a little larger because our state's growing, than, but, but still it's an extraordinary. And Greg Walden from Eastern Oregon, uh, has the second largest number, and that's because the, uh, Oregon has done an extraordinary job with outreach and the Oregon Health Plan in getting people signed up uh, for health care. And it has obviously saved lives, uh, it's improved their health, it's improved the economy because many of these people wouldn't have been able to keep working without health care. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's absolutely uh, essential. It has actually lowered health care costs for all the rest of us because when someone goes to the hospital and they don't have health insurance, someone's got to pay the bill. Uh, and most of the time we're talking about people who don't have uh, assets or adequate, although before the Affordable Care Act, the most frequent cause of bankruptcy in the United States of America was an uninsured health emergency. Uh, I had a friend, a very good friend, who was the CFO years ago at McKenzie Willamette, and uh, one day he said, you know, I just quit. And I said, Steve, why'd you quit? You loved your job. He says, I got tired of taking away people's houses. Uh, so, um, you know, this, that's the way it used to be. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, we could go back there with a total repeal. So um, pre-existing conditions. Uh, there are 133 million Americans with pre-existing conditions. In my congressional district alone, 312,000 people, including me and probably a few of you here in this room. Um, and it used to be we were uninsurable, or yeah, I'll, uh, we'll give you a policy, but it's gonna exclude this, and it's gonna cost this, which made you essentially uninsurable. Uh, no longer uh, can that happen. We have uh, over two million young adults, 28,000 in Oregon between 19 and 26, are just starting their working lives or in college, uh, have health insurance, who didn't have health insurance, uh, previously, uh, and you know the uh, we also uh, with with the with Medicaid, uh, if we lost that, and you know a lot of people, and part of the reason I'm going around doing this, most of you probably know it, but there are a lot of people in my district. You know, Hillary only won my district by 554 votes, so there are a lot of people in my district who are on expanded Medicaid who hate Obamacare. Uh, and, you know, if I talk to them, ah, and Obamacare, it's horrible. And I say, well, you're on the Oregon Health Plan, right? Yeah, I said, and you're on ex expanded Medicaid under the Oregon Health Plan. That's Obamacare. And they're, you know, they don't, they, you know, it, it's a, a, tough, uh, a, a tough message for people, but it's true. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I'm going around holding, holding these town halls to, to educate people as to what is really at risk. Uh, and, it's, and it's extraordinary. Now, that's not to say uh, that the ACA is a, a perfect piece of legislation. In fact, I was one of the last people to agree to vote for it uh, because we had a much better bill in the House. Uh, we had, instead of state-by-state -state exchanges, we had national exchanges, meaning huge groups of people, lower premiums. We had a national not-for-profit government-run exchange which I believe would have demonstrated to people what Medicare for all could be or what single payer could be. Uh, and we took away the antitrust immunity of the health insurance industry. Uh, they can and they do collude to um, you know, set rates or operate in different markets and not compete with one another. That's all legal under a, a law passed uh, before I was born uh, by Congress. Um, and we changed that in the House bill uh, but all those things uh, went away when, uh, with the Senate bill, and we didn't get to have a real legislative process because we had a great bill. The Senate had a not-so-great bill to be charitable, uh, and then Teddy Kennedy died, and it was either take the Senate bill or do nothing. And with 56 million Americans uninsured, I didn't feel we could do nothing, but I said, we're going to have to fix this. 
Uh, as soon as we pass it, we need to start working on fixing this because there's a, a lot of problems with it. A big problem for us here in Oregon is that we get some of the lowest Medicare reimbursements in the United States of America, which means a lot of physicians are not uh, really thrilled with the idea of taking someone who's on Medicare, and people who are on Medicare can have a difficult time finding a physician who will accept them, primary care provider. And that's because <clears throat> when the, uh, uh, the Medicare Act was passed uh, back uh, when LBJ was president, we, they looked around the country and they set the rates according to what medical costs were in the different regions of the country. And we were really inexpensive and New York and Florida were relatively high. And um, what's happened over time is that, 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 that we've never reviewed that, uh, the formula. Uh, so all we've done is increase it by percentage. So if you start higher, and you give the same percent to both, what happens is you know, now for a given procedure in Florida, a Medicare reimbursement might be three times what it is uh, for a physician in Oregon. But you know, the, that's, uh, it's outrageous and it's, and it's wasteful. We are one of the, you know, there's 17 states that are known as quality care providers uh, and we formed a coalition during the consideration of the, the Affordable Care Act and said, you have to address our concerns in this legislation. And the House bill did, the Senate bill didn't. Uh, and so there were a number of us in the coalition said, wait a minute, you're gonna pass this, and you know, this isn't gonna work so well for our people. Uh, you're not gonna fix the Medicare reimbursement rate. And uh, Kathleen Sebelius, who was then head of HHS, uh, they were getting concerned because it was gonna be a very close vote. And there were about eight of us holding out and saying, you got to fix this. So she came down to my office one night, actually, and uh, met with uh, eight of us or so. And what she promised is they would have a process and they would finally fix the Medicare reimbursement rate, which would mean, if we do it rationally, Florida comes down and we go up. And there's a point in the middle there where we're going to be closer together because they are incredibly inefficient providers of care down there. I mean, if you go in for an appendectomy, you might spend five days in the hospital, even if you don't have complications in Florida. In Oregon, I don't know that it's outpatient, but it's pretty quick in and out. Uh, and our costs are way lower per capita for the same procedures. Uh, and uh, you know that needed to be fixed. And uh, she did do the first part of it, which is to study the inequities and said, yeah, what do you know, this, is, this doesn't make sense. But part two, to fix them, uh, never happened. Uh, so we still have we still have that issue hanging out there, and then the, there's a, a question we had the administrator of the uh, uh, hospital in Florence uh, say that 30 percent of his costs are administering paperwork uh, to try and weave through the myriad of health plans that are out there. I mean, any of you talk to your individual doctors and ask how many people do they have to keep on staff to try and figure out. How to, how to get you services, and how often your doctor even has to get involved and call up a clerk at an insurance company and say, you know, <laughs> they really need this medicine, they really need this procedure, oh, well, you know. And so that's incredibly burdensome and expensive. Uh, Medicare, the administrative costs run about uh, between two and 3% uh, for Medicare. And uh, for uh, private insurance companies, uh, administrative costs, sales and marketing run about 26%, essentially wasted money. And then they put a further burden on the system by complicating it and having the physicians and the hospitals have to hire staff to kind of get through these individual insurance plans. If we had, uh, you know, if we had standardized plans or you know, looking at an improved Medicare, uh, you had someone make to the point to be, wait a minute, you're gonna, you want people all on Medicare and it's not so good. I said, no, you're right. It's improved Medicare, which would include hearing, vision, uh, you know, and dental, which it doesn't now. Uh, you know, there's no real, you know, a lot of seniors have all those needs, but you don't, you know, a few of the Advantage plans will give you those benefits, uh, but not very many, and I think they're relatively uh, expensive to, to get to those kind of benefits. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're beginning a discussion about uh, a single payer, Medicare for all, or whatever you want to call it, uh, in, this, in, the, in the House. Uh, we will hold hearings on it uh, this year. Uh, there's been legislation introduced, a Medicare for all bill. I've also introduced a bill to go back to the House, House bill for the ACA and have a national not-for-profit government-run plan. 
because uh, I run into way too many people who are in the Oregon Exchange. Uh, and I was talking to one small business owner, his premium, and he's 50 years old, it's a thousand bucks a month for a not great plan with a $6,000 deductible. Uh, so, um, you know, what kind of insurance is that? Yeah, if he, you know, if he's horribly sick or injured, he'll, he'll keep him from going bankrupt, but that's really not much in terms of health care coverage. Uh, so we really have to work on that. And, and it's only gotten worse because of the complications of the Affordable Care Act. There was something called risk quarters. The whole idea was the plan says you have to take anybody who comes in to buy your policy, you got to take them. And the actuaries at the private insurance companies go nuts, like, no, no, we can't do that. We have to know what the, what the possibility is that that person's going to get sick, or they have been sick, and we don't want to. Uh, so uh, Congress said, okay, well, we're going to put this mandate on you, but um, since you know, we don't want premiums to skyrocket, we, we want you to keep them as low as possible, and if you, and if you find out you've recruited you know, to your company a group that have excessive losses, we will reimburse you for the excessive uh, losses. Well, the re Republicans defunded that uh, two years ago, so we've seen a big spike in the premiums under the Affordable Care Act uh, for people, uh, you know, who have to buy through the exchanges. So, I mean, there's some things maybe we can get done to improve it. Uh, you know, I don't think we're going to see major changes. I mean, it, you know, the Senate is really not cranking out. Uh, we've sent a number of bills to the Senate, election reform bills and other things that Mitch has said not even going to get a hearing. So, um, you know, we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens. But if the court does repeal the Affordable Care Act, I think something is going to have to happen. We're not going to kick 23 million Americans off their health insurance in one day and not see an incredible outcry and, and uh, a, you know, potential collapse of the health care system uh, in this country. So, uh, so we're laying the groundwork by talking about it now, getting people to start thinking about what's the next step after the Affordable Care Act. And, um, this is always a thoughtful group. So I thought it would be a useful presentation for you. So that's it. And I'd be happy to take questions. We can use this one for questions. I can, that way I can walk around and You're you can, huh? Okay, you, you want to use that? Otherwise, I would take it to the person out there. Oh, the yeah, well, that's a good idea. Take it out to the person. I turned it on. Okay, we're going to start with Sharon. <laughs> okay, I thought I probably should mention the elephant that's in this room with us <laughs> and ask you, I know you haven't had a chance to read the whole oh. report, <laughs> but just to give us your views on what you think might happen and what you think should happen now that it's been more or less released? Probably more or less. Uh, uh, my colleague, Jerry Nadler, who chairs the Judiciary Committee, uh, we, we've already voted in the House uh, to require that he submit a unredacted report to Congress. Uh, he, uh, Barr has said he's going to give a less redacted report to the Judiciary Committee, not to all the members of Congress. Uh, and, uh, you know, Jerry was uh, reported on the radio today saying that's, that's not adequate. Uh, you know, we need the whole report. We need also the investigative materials uh, to go through. Uh, you know, the, the, it was not as presented by uh, Attorney General Barr. It's not an exoneration. Um, you know, there's a lot of disturbing material in the few snippets I've read and heard. Um, about the conduct of the president, but then again, they're not, it's not very surprising uh, to me. Uh, the question is, uh, did it, you know, there's arguments over the legal points, obstruction of justice uh, is more likely than collusion. Uh, coll collusion requires, you gotta understand intent, and who knows what the intent of President Trump is on a, on a given day. Uh, but um, there will be a lot of scrutiny uh, on this by the Judiciary Committee and the Intelligence Committee as relates to the uh, Russian angle, um, and we will see what uh, we unearth. Uh, I expect they will try and slow walk or make us go to court to try and get an unredacted copy and to get the investigative materials. Uh, we'll see if, if, you know, how, that, how that works out. So it's a, it's a work in progress, um, but you know, and I'm you know I, I know I'm here at the league. I'm not supposed to be particularly political, but 
Uh, we will work on that, and I, if, if uh, impeachable offenses are unearthed, it would be uh, our duty to go forward. Uh, but uh, you know, we know that the Senate would, no matter what uh, we unearth, uh, will not act. Uh, so it would be uh, a dead end, and uh, it potentially could have the inadvertent effect of helping to reelect uh, President Trump, which I don't want. So. Uh, you know, I, I'm bending my efforts to the political side as the legal side, but then again, I'm not a lawyer, but I'll leave that up to all my lawyer friends in Congress to figure that stuff out. <coughs> no one else. Oh, there we go. Someone. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask a question as I walk across the room. Uh -oh. um, and it's a question about whether or not you can actually get an infrastructure bill done. Oh, well, that's an easy one. Uh, I kicked off the year, um, you know, we've, for years we've talked about how underfunded we are, how great the needs are, uh, you know, we've got uh, 47,000 bridges that are structurally deficient on the national highway system, 235,000 need a significant amount of work, and bridge, bridge problems accelerate uh, in a, you know, in a geometric way. Uh, that you know, you give you wait two years, and your problem is way you know way worse than it was two years ago. Uh, so that's uh, that's a big bill. Uh, Forty percent of the national highway surface uh, system highway is deteriorated to the point where we have to rebuild it from the roadbed up, not just resurface it. And then we have a hundred billion dollar backlog to bring transit up to a state of good repair, let alone to begin to build new transit options to help people get out of congestion uh, and stop wasting fuel stuck in traffic. So I have the opportunity to write what would be the first 21st century surface transportation bill. Uh, we've really been living off the legacy of Dwight David Eisenhower uh, and uh, the national highway system. The only, the biggest change that's happened since he uh, enacted that or he signed it and Congress passed it was when Ronald Reagan added in transit in 1984, uh, recognizing that you know that had to be uh, that, that those are the economic engines of the country, the major urban areas, and they can't be all tied up in congestion. And we need more transit and better transit. Uh, but uh, we haven't changed the federal gas tax since 1993. It has about half the buying power it had in '93, and we have uh, three times uh, as many cars on the road. Uh, you know, uh, and trucks and uh, vehicle miles travel go up every year and the system deteriorates, so we have to do something. Uh, we also have to account for climate change. Uh, we have to build a more resilient infrastructure. We have to build infrastructure that's going to be ready for potentially uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, we uh, need to build the infrastructure itself in ways that are less polluting. There's a way to make concrete that uh, pollutes a lot less. It's very polluting uh, production process in terms of carbon and uh, other gases. Uh, there's a whole host of steps we could take. Plus, I uh, think that we're either going to go to hydrogen fuel cells if we figure out how to make electro uh, biofuels, which are way more efficient than our current biofuels. Ethanol is a total loser. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we've got to look toward that future in writing the bill. Uh, the key thing is going to be, can we fund it? And uh, that's the discussion that's ongoing. Uh, I've met with the president. I've met with his chief economic advisor. I had met numerous times with his past transportation advisor who was firmly locked into something that even Trump didn't want to do, which is let's privatize the entire system in America, toll everything, and, uh, and work our way out of it that way. I pointed out to him that most of the country isn't profitably tollable, uh, and, so that, and particularly the red areas aren't going to be real thrilled about that, and they're still paying gas tax. Uh, but uh, his, re his report was reflected again in the president's budget because I think the president's chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, wants to go that way. Uh, the president said he didn't, doesn't like that, and, he, and that's why he didn't include it in the State of the Union. So I am now working with Ivanka Trump to see if we can work this out. <laughs> but I know she has good access to the president. So. I wanted to ask you about the Texas case you mentioned with the, that's trying to repeal the ACA. Um, would you just briefly talk about what the issue is and if that case results in repealing the ACA, what will happen then? 
Well, um, a lot of attorneys say it's a reach, uh, but it, they did win in district court. Uh, and their argument is since Congress repealed the penalties uh, for not having insurance, and since uh, Justice Roberts' opinion was based upon the taxation power of Congress, uh, therefore, without uh, people paying penalties, that the ACA is unconstitutional. That's the gist of their argument, uh, and they did win in district court. It's now pending in circuit court, and that's where uh, the Justice Department has weighed in. Uh, you know, a, a large number of states, I believe, including Oregon, uh, have filed uh, on the other side, saying, you know, this is just a, a specious argument. Uh, but, uh, you know, you never know when you're in the courts and that they chose, you know, they district shopped and they found a very conservative district and, uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the circuit. And then, of course, we would end up in the Supreme Court, who has already decided once that it was constitutional, but that was two justices ago. So I'm not sure what, what would come out of there. Uh, Uh, yeah, each body um, governs itself, uh, and we govern under very different rules. Uh, the House uh, has a rules committee, uh, which sets the conditions uh, for which any bill goes forward to the floor, whether it can be amended, not amended, and that. Uh, and the majority of that committee is ap appointed by the majority party. Uh, so that's the, that's the House process. We do have some better rules in terms of uh, we require that uh, things must be germane, and the Senate doesn't have a germaneness rule, so you can attach anything to anything. Uh, and in the Senate, the majority leader is the, the ultimate uh, power under the bizarre rules under which they act, uh, and you also have over there the filibuster. Uh, so. Um, you know, you need 60 votes in the Senate to do anything substantive other than appoint, appoint Supreme Court justices and other uh, things like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's a, a very, very high bar. The House is a very simple majority. Uh, I think we're doing a better job so far. Uh, and it's a little bit more like it used to be when I first came there where, uh, you know, we would offer a diversity of amendments on a bill and just see who won, who didn't win because uh, that's maybe you improve the legislation. We do that in committee to improve legislation or fix problems with it. But uh, it's still not an, an open process, and part of it is uh, we'll see in June. Uh, appropriations bills traditionally have come up under an open amendment process. They have to be germane. But you can offer a 1,000 amendments and say, well, I want to cut the bill by 10%. 9.999 percent, 9.9, and that's happened. There was a guy named Floyd Flake who used to do that. He would offer 20 amendments on an appropriations bill to just cut at different levels, and none of them would ever succeed. So at that point, then uh, we uh, maybe go back to the Rules Committee and say, okay, we're going to debate this bill for a limited period of time. So we will have, we'll, we will experiment again with a totally open process in in June, and we'll see see how it goes. But. There's a, you know, unfortunately, the, and this is another speech I gave about our representative democracy, can it survive? And the biggest problem in the House is gerrymandering. And gerrymandering leads to the polarization of the parties. You know, I'm very rare to have a district that could be Republican or Democrat. There's maybe uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 Demo uh, districts that can easily go one way or another. I've got one of them, Kurt Schrader has one because we redistricted uh, kind of honestly in Oregon, but in other states, uh, Pennsylvania is a great example. Uh, they were down to, uh, I think, two Democrats, even uh, you know, in the state after redistricting. Their Supreme Court just threw out uh, that uh, redistricting, uh, and the Supreme Court drew the new maps, and now there's uh, seven Democrats, uh, which represents the overall vote in the state, as opposed to states like Minnesota, where the Republicans uh, get 51% of the vote in the state legislature and control 65% of the legislature because of artfully drawn maps on the state level, let alone the federal level. So 
Um, so in the House, that's part of the problem is this partisanship. We used to, we used to I mean, used to be like, this would be a, a liberal Republican, this would be a conservative Democrat, and you had this whole area in between. Those lines don't even meet anymore. So. Peter, I'd like to go back to health care for a minute uh, and cost. Put in a plug for John Kitzhaber, who had uh, cost control measures with his committee to uh, essentially uh, rate both procedures and diagnoses as to what would be covered. I don't hear much in the way of cost control measures except getting rid of insurance executives in the current ongoing discussion and plans. I wonder if you had a comment or answer the question as to how are we going to save some money there? Well, uh, number one would, I mean, we have, we are saving money and, and that was quantified by the, uh, a number of the experts uh, who testified in my town halls this week in terms of extending preventative care and avoided cost. Uh, you know, so that's, that's key. And right now everybody gets free preventative care under their insurance plan, whether they're on Medicare, Medicaid, or a private plan. That didn't, exists before, you know, if you want to have a colonoscopy and your doc says, well, time for a colonoscopy, oh, that's not covered, that's going to cost me 2500 bucks. I think I'll skip it, and then you end up with colon cancer. So uh, that was a, a major measure. There were, were other that were supposed to be, and there are, uh, you know, there were uh, a number of qualitative uh, measures also that were supposed to be tracked in terms of provision of care and then incentives or penalties to hospitals that would meet those in terms of readmissions or not. Uh, so there, there's still some things that are extant that are uh, cost controls, not great. But, you know, the average health care inflation has pretty well, I mean, it was going up really high, then we started considering the Affordable Care Act and, you know, kind of leveled off. And now it's going up more gradually, except for pharmaceuticals, which is a glaring example. Uh, pharmaceuticals are far outpacing the rest of uh, an inflationary cost in, in medical care, and that's uh, that's something that uh, I think we're going we're going to try and deal with uh, next month. Uh, in terms, I personally, for years, have supported the, the government negotiating drug prices. Uh, every other industrialized nation on earth does that, uh, no matter what their healthcare system is, whether it's partially private, private, or single payer. Uh, Great Britain, Germany, uh, they negotiate the drug prices and then they get a, the health plans buy the drugs for the patients and they're paying significantly less than we are for their drugs. So that's one measure that is, uh, is commonly uh, talked about. Uh, you know, getting into limiting procedures uh, is, uh, you know, there were, that was part of the original uh, Affordable Care Act was to look at uh, procedures and see whether or not those procedures, what the kinds of outcomes were and or drugs, what the outcomes were. Unfortunately, most of that got defunded uh, when we lost control. So we haven't done a lot of that and we should be doing more of that. So, yes. Um, something that I've become aware of recently is the dangers with um, 5G technology. Mm -hmm. Has there been any um, consciousness or any talk in Washington about this issue and the dangers? Well, um, the, uh, the last FCC study was long before uh, on electromagnetic uh, radiation was way before the invention of 5G or 4G or 3G. It was back in the 90s. Uh, so uh, I have uh, written to the uh, Federal Communications Commission and asked for what data they're using to determine that it is safe uh, and asking whether they are looking at and pointing out that I think they should look at studies uh, in the modern era uh, in this century uh, to assess the health effects. Uh, I'm also a sponsor of legislation. The, the, the reason this can go forward, even if a community objects, is uh, the telecommunications deregulation of uh, 1996. Uh, and I was one of 16 people to vote against it. Uh, and I said, I, don't, I, I just don't like this. We preempted cities, we preempted counties uh, from siting of both uh, energy facilities in, uh, in, in the Bush-Cheney energy policy but then earlier than that, under the, Bush, under the Gore Clinton policy, we preempted communities from controlling the siting of cable or other electronic uh, devices, essentially uh, took them out of the equation. 
and um, that's a that's a real problem. And also really limited their capability of you know getting any revenues out of the installation of say cable in a public right of way or or that. So uh, I'm on a bill that would roll back the the latest FCC ruling. Uh, which even liberalizes that more and, and shortens the time period where a community gets to comment. And I'm working on a bill just to return us to the status quo ante, which is that local communities can have control uh, over these things. And if a community doesn't want it, uh, they shouldn't be forced to have it. And personally, you know, I mean, I'm fairly addicted to these devices, everybody is, but uh, I don't see that we need to make a leap to 5G, uh, and there are, there are actually alternate technologies that apparently don't have the health effects uh, that could uh, speed up the system if you really have to be able to stream some gigantic file while you're walking down the street with your cell phone, as opposed to being at home and getting connected through the cable or satellite or however you're connected, or in my case, out in East Springfield through the copper wire. So. Um, what information can you share about the impact of the administration's policy on immigration and how that is impacting the availability of farm workers and construction workers in Oregon and other places? Well, I, I would say the most evident impact uh, is the whole chilling effect on any uh, immigration or visas into the country. And I've heard most from higher education about the loss of, of uh, student enrollment. Uh, I, I hear from the uh, uh, agriculture industry, uh, you know, the, when they come in, particularly the nursery industry, uh, that it's uh, having a major impact on their capability of getting, uh, of getting workers. Uh, forestry uh, also has problems uh, getting workers. I haven't heard uh, so much from construction yet. There seems to be, there's sort of an ongoing uh, dispute in construction, whether or not we need uh, a lot of, uh, you know, immigrant labor in construction and whether or not Americans would take those jobs as opposed to picking strawberries in the field or, or other things like that. And I haven't, I haven't seen a, a, a good economic summary by, uh, by sector, but there are studies of uh, how much it benefits the economy to have immigrants in the country, which, and the numbers are, are quite astounding. So uh, it's obviously an ongoing debate. I mean, the, the problem has been um, a number of times, well, we had a comprehensive immigration reform bill which would have, uh, a number of years ago, which would have solved all these issues. It was tough, but it was fair, and it would have taken care of all the people who had, you know, who had been here by a certain date. Uh, they would have had to, uh, you know, undergo a background check. Uh, they'd have to pay fines, they would have to file, they would get a different, they would get a card that gave them legal status, but it wasn't a permanent status, and then they'd, in five years, they'd go through the process again, 10 years, they could begin to get in line for citizenship, and the rationale for 10 years was, there's a lot of people in Mexico and the Philippines who are on the list to legally come here, and they're waiting 10 or 12 years to do it. So the idea was, if someone came here illegally, we're not gonna jump them ahead of everybody, but we're not gonna throw them out either. Uh, so um, that was a good bill. Uh, I, we, it would have passed in the House if the Republicans had allowed us to vote on it at that time, uh, you know. But uh, they didn't. Uh, you know, right now, uh, you know, immigration has become an incredibly polarized uh, issue, and is, they're, we're having no rational uh, discussion about it. I'm not sure whether the leadership plans uh, on trying to move anything or, or not. Uh, we've tried a couple of times to deal with a subset, which is immigrant labor, uh, and that uh, you know, and and but the problem is we've always in the Senate had problem getting protections uh, for the labor, uh, so that the labor can't be exploited uh, if they're coming in as seasonal workers. But it would solve part of the illegal immigrant problem. Well, now we're having more of a problem with asylum uh, seekers than we are with people uh, who are coming in illegally to work. Uh, but uh, if we could have a program where they got full protection of labor laws and, uh, and treatment uh, as they came here and worked and they could come and go, uh, that would solve a lot of the problem. I mean, because a lot of people come here, work, and send the money home, but they would be just as happy to go home when they're not harvesting uh, and then come back the next harvest season. But after they have paid a smuggler to get across the border the first time, they can't go back. So uh, we're, we're doing a lot of things that are stupid. Yes. Um, I want to talk about 
transportation, which I think you have some influence on, or hopefully can, uh, just recently came down from Portland and it only cost $350 on a plane. And uh, we had a little snow thing here, making it difficult and having to stay in Portland was unreasonable. The, anything where you do it at the last minute, you pay an arm and a leg, and otherwise you pay just a finger of a difference. And I've asked people what they paid and what I paid for $350 for 20 minutes on an airplane is not right. Mm -hmm. The trains sit on the track while the traffic goes through and the people sit there. We don't have our own uh, rails. And I just think we're kind of behind and we need to get where we should be with both our planes and our trains. Mm -hmm. Can you help us out? Uh, well, I, I can tell you what I'm working on. Um, first off, many, many years ago, I've been doing this a long time, a guy named Al Swift from Washington State uh, was on transportation appropriations. I was on transportation. I was relatively junior. I think it was 1995. Uh, and uh, we decided to put up uh, the potential for high-speed rail and designate six high-speed railroads for the United States. And Oregon uh, was part of one of those six routes back in the mid-90s, and that route was to go from Eugene to Vancouver, B.C. Uh, Washington has put a fair amount of money into this uh, on their side. Oregon has done nothing. Uh, we've done a little bit through Connect Oregon in terms of a couple of sidings and a few grade crossings. But uh, you have to deal with the grade crossings. You have to deal with sidings for the freight or the passenger. Oregon has been working on deciding what the route would be since 1995. And I keep hearing they're close to making a decision. Uh, that was why they couldn't apply for funds under the Recovery Act for high or higher speed. I, I'm calling it higher speed because it's not going to be like Shinkansen or TGV. Uh, but if it could be dependable. Anyway, Oregon's getting close to apparently choosing a route, uh, and then I will uh, help uh, work on that with them uh, as we go through a service transportation bill and allocate funds. Uh, but the other thing I'm doing shorter term is uh, Amtrak has a, a president uh, who I think is doing a really great job, new president. He used to run Delta Airlines, and he's trying to bring Amtrak into the 20th century. It'd be too big of a shock to come to the 21st. <laughs> But he's trying to move him to the 20th century. And uh, I mean, he came, when he came in to see me first, he showed me his, he had a pass. He could go up in a locomotive. He was proud of that. And then he pulls out his iPhone. He says, I've got this. And they says, oh, I also have these. And he pulls out a key ring of skeleton keys. He said, when's the last time you saw a skeleton key? And I said, well, when I was a kid. So um, anyway, he, um, the thing is, as you pointed out, uh, we don't own the right of way. Uh, except we own some a substantial amount right away in the on the East Coast because of, of a railroad that went bankrupt. Uh, but we had Congress mandated that freight had to give preference to passenger trains, uh, and uh, unfortunately, it got litigated and was overturned in court. So we have to reinstate that rule because uh, since then the t on time performance has just gone in the tank. Uh, and what I said to Richard, I said, look, you know, if you could tell me that dependably I could get to Portland from Eugene in two hours, I would never get on I-5 again. Because, I mean, when I drove down uh, last weekend, it, it, there was a, something happened just north of Corvallis, a car fire. It was, you know, it was almost three hours to get here. Uh, and um, so he's actually working on that because uh, he managed to negotiate successfully on the Crescent route. Uh, which is being pushed by, I think, uh, Senator Wicker, who's my, uh, one of my uh, uh, compatriots on, on the Senate side. Controlling. He controls part of the jurisdiction of my committee. My jurisdiction of my committee is in four committees on the Senate side, but he controls rail. And, um, and so Amtrak was working to please him. He wanted more dependability. And CSX said, yeah, well, you can do it, but it's going to cost you uh, you know, I, I, I think the number was somewhere around uh, $1.2 billion because we're going to need all this work. And Richard said, well, look, could we just, could you do, like give me your schedules and that and, and just have my people look this over? And CSX did. And after his people, what he, the new people he's brought in, uh, went over it, they said, no, you, that's really, no, all we need is like three sidings. And they can do it for $84 million. 
and they will get the times they want. And so CSX said, okay, if you'll pay us $84 million, we'll build the sidings and we'll run it that way. So uh, hopefully we will be able to, I'm hoping he's gonna find the same solutions for here to Portland. Uh, and I'm hoping Oregon will also choose a route for the future uh, and then we can uh, move forward. Uh, planes, uh, you know, uh, de they're deregulated a long time ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, in terms of their fares, their answer, they make more money now in ancillary fees than they do tickets, uh, change fees and that. And the reason in part they do that is because those things aren't taxed. Uh, we run the system with a ticket tax, and, but the ancillary fees aren't taxed, so it's gravy for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's something that uh, I'm going to be working on and a, a number of other issues that go to passenger consumer rights. Uh, I just had to spend the last three years in the minority blocking the airlines from taking over air traffic control in the United States of America, which is what they wanted to do. And my chairman wanted to help them do it. And from the minority, I managed to block that. And that would have been a disaster for general aviation and for passengers and everybody else because they would have removed the ticket tax that pays for the system. That was part of the bill, 7.5% on every ticket. And then they would have decided what new fee to charge you, and they would have taken that 7.5%, which is $11 billion a year, uh, into their profits. So I've just had sort of a major confrontation and victory with the airlines, but I'll see what else I can do. Uh, it took me 32 years to get to be chairman, so I'm not sure about our lifetimes and getting this stuff done. Hi, I think I need a refresher uh, course on what a single-payer system means. You've, you've referred to the insurance uh, exchanges, and I've kind of lost my uh, way on, on what they're advocating right now. Well, uh, single-payer could take uh, different forms. Uh, as, in, as envisioned by most people here, it would be something like Medicare for All, where there's one set of rules, one set of reimbursements. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, uh, that's uh, greatly simplified from, from the current system. Uh, the physicians and hospitals would still either be public or private, whatever they are now. It wouldn't change that. It wouldn't be like the British system where uh, most providers work for the state itself. Uh, it would be, uh, you know, so you would still have... Uh, you know, uh, publicly and privately run hospitals or, or nonprofit publicly and privately run for-profit hospitals. Uh, you would still have physicians working in different groups that relate different ways, but, but the insurance plans would be uniform uh, so that it would, they wouldn't have to employ a whole bunch of people. I had, uh, I was interviewing the Law News last week or this week, I can't remember, I've been traveling around this week, and uh, one reporter got really upset. He said, well, what are you going to do with all those people who process the, the claims and the bills now? He says, they're all going to be unemployed. And I said, well, maybe we can, um, you know, uh, help them out with retraining to become nurses or because we have a nursing shortage or something like that. So, uh, you know. Um, uh, Nonpartisan question. Um, is there any uh, congressional committee that's investigating the Russia hacking from the Russia end Disregarding Mr. Trump, um, such for instance, there's one uh, that has summoned his, uh, subpoenaed his tax records. Uh, outside of the Mueller follow-up, uh, looking for the ISP addresses and/or out in and out phone numbers of every tabulator in every state, especially the ones that the he won the electoral college votes, like the three or four. Uh, Ohio and Wisconsin and so on. Um, is anyone, because they, I mean, NSA's whole reason to be is, is uh, metadata, which is who called, particularly from Moscow, to the Ohio tabulator? And uh, that would kind of tell us uh, if they directly hacked the vote. And it would be cool if it also incidentally caught the the National Republican Committee or, or even the Democrats doing that hacking? Well, what we need is a system that can't be hacked, uh, and that's pretty simple. That's the Oregon system. Uh, you know, there is a paper trail. 
Uh, I think there's there's still, and I don't I don't have the number at the top of my head, because uh, but there's there's I think 12 or 13 states that still don't have paper trails. Uh, so you've got to worry about the systems. There were some strange anomalies in the election in Ohio, in Bush v. Gore, they were investigated, never conclusively proven. Uh, so, but that's a proprietary software written by a company owned by a right-wing guy. So, uh, you know, I just don't think there should ever be a totally electronic system. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, that's part of the reform when we passed H.R. 1. Uh, it was a mandate every state have a paper trail, uh, so you could not have an electronic system. Uh, whether you know, I mean, the uh, uh, the intelligence committee under Adam Schiff is spending a lot of time on these issues: the Russian influence and direct or indirect action taken by Russia. Most of the action that uh, r that's come out so far was indirect but influential in terms of social media influencing people, uh, doing uh, uh, essentially propaganda. So. Uh, that I'm not aware that they have found any direct uh, links into uh, changing the vote, uh, and, but they, they are looking very broadly and very deeply into those issues, and that's, that's all going on, you know, that's not, I could, I could go to the secret room in the Capitol and I could, you know, and I could review whatever they've produced so far, but I'm, I'm busy with other things and I'll let them do their work and they come to a conclusion, then I'll find out, so. Well, we did, you know, Trump was reluctant to impose any sanctions on Russia, and uh, we did, Congress did push uh, for some minimal sanctions, but uh, there should have been a lot more, and obviously he's... So what I'm saying is that why didn't you have an NSA if Moscow didn't have anywhere nuclear plants as well as their voting, uh, and have the Russians have the same kind of power that they have in Russia? Yeah, well, you know, I... I, uh, you know, the years ago when we had uh, Admiral, whatever his name was, under Bush, who Point Dexter, and he wanted to get, uh, basically get every transaction and every movement of every American that was trackable, your credit card transaction, and put it in a giant database and figure out something. And, and I said at the time, you know, I think you, you're like two years behind on photo analysis uh, for, you know, like uh, secret facilities. I mean, how are you going to, what are you going to do with all this data? What's the algorithm, you know? So anyway, there is some pointless gathering of data that is never evaluated, and I would question many times the effectiveness of our intelligence agencies, but again, I don't serve on that committee, so it's, it's something that I, I don't, really, I'm not an expert on. I don't mean to cut you short on this. We sure. do have a proposed study at the state level in, at, for the Oregon League on cybersecurity and privacy today. I do care about this. Right. You mentioned in the context of transportation that you care about resiliency, and you have worked for a resiliency uh, alarm system. And can you tell us what's new with that, and thank you for working on it? Uh, well... I traveled, I guess it's two years ago now, to Japan to learn from the experience of their tsunami and uh, major earthquake. And one of the key things was that they didn't have deep ocean sensors. Uh, and so they, they had sensors to, they got the magnitude of the quake, and then they, from that, estimated the size of the, uh, the tsunami. And when the waves hit their near shore sensors, they found out they were about eight feet higher. So they had told people, if you're at 12 feet, or I can't remember now, I could, but you're safe. Well, a whole lot of people sheltered in place at what they, and they broadcast that. And then when the tsunami hit the closer buoys, they said, oh my God, uh, those people are going to die. But the cell towers were all down, and they had no way to communicate that they had new information. So the lessons learned were, we need deep ocean sensors. Uh, we need a real-time system. We need resilient cell towers that have backup generation so we can transmit any changes or we can continue to communicate. And I've been working on that. I've gotten, I just passed a bill in this Congress to uh, say that uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency has to plan uh, a comprehensive system for the West Coast. We passed that in the House. It hasn't come up in the Senate yet. And I have gotten a little bit of money over time. I've worked with the U of O and a consortium of universities, and we have deployed some sensors, but nowhere near what we need, and they're all land-based, and they're not going to help us with the tsunami issue. And, you know, the more warning you have, there was a, there's a really interesting video clip, and it's, a, you know, they get a lot of, 
earthquakes in Mexico City. They have a, a very elaborate system of sensors. And so they, you know, where the, wherever the fault is uh, around Mexico City, they get the earliest warning and, it's, and the shock wave takes about 20 or 25 seconds or 30 seconds, I can't, I don't know exactly, to hit the mainly populated area. And it was in a TV studio and the guy is like, the, the alarm had come through and he said everybody should, you know, get to a safe place now. He's saying you must run, get to a safe place, you know, or, you know a tremor is coming. And everything's very calm, and then all of a sudden everything in the studio starts going like this after he's been talking for a little bit. So that's, that's if you're very close. Uh, you know, where we're at, uh, if we had deep ocean sensors, we could have maybe three to five minutes here. Portland would have 10 minutes. In Japan, they shut down everything. I mean, they, the elevators stop at a floor and the doors open. Uh, you know, they shut down the, the, uh, the Shinkansen, it doesn't move. Uh, you know, they, 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 they have a, like essentially an automated system to mitigate damage and loss of life. Uh, and that's, that's one point. The other is for people on the Oregon coast, uh, you know, we've drawn lines now on the roads uh, to say if you get over this line, you're safe, but how much time are you gonna have to get there and do you know the route? And we don't practice very much. So the, we're, we are living on borrowed time and we need to do a lot more to, because this is gonna happen sooner or later. Hopefully, you know, I won't be here, but uh, you know, someone in this room probably will be or not. Anything else, Linda? Well, I could ask you a question about redistricting. So leagues, leagues across the country are supporting a movement to get independent redistricting commissions, oh. essentially take, take it from the legislature, legislature to an independent commission. So there's some bills out there at the state legislature to do that, which are probably not gonna move. Kevin Mannix has an initiative petition on the issue I wouldn't call his proposal an independent commission. So what do you think? Uh, well, HR1 mandated uh, independent commissions for redistricting for Congress. We can't mandate what the states do for state legislature, but we would have mandated independent commissions uh, for Congress, and we put certain conditions on what they would consider community of interest, compact, uh, and, and a whole host of, of other criteria. What you got to watch out for is people who have an agenda and are trying to sell you a bill of goods. Uh, like our former secretary, recently deceased secretary of state, wanted to have a, you know, he wanted to have a commission that basically wasn't uh, independent but was partisan. Uh, so you have to figure out how, how do you construct an independent commission? What are the criteria they have to use in creating districts? And I fully support that. You also have to watch out for other stupid ideas like Phil Kiesling's idea that we should have a, uh, uh, you know, we should have a top two like they have uh, in California. And I pointed out to Phil, I said, Phil, you, I have a swing district and I know you come from Portland and you know, you Democrat can get elected even if they're dead. But uh, you know, in my district, that means I run two general elections a year because I can't afford to come out second in the primary. So it would double the cost of running for office in districts that are truly uh, swing districts. And then you get the perverse thing, which has happened in California, where you end up with two Republicans or two Democrats on the, on the general election ballot, which doesn't make people really happy. What do you mean I don't get another choice? Well, you can do a write-in. Oh, yeah, sure. And independent parties would never, ever be, on, you know, be in a general election under that system. So. Uh, it has been rejected. Uh, I think it was on the ballot. I can't remember a number of years ago we rejected it, and uh, hopefully that won't come back. But, but the independent commission to do away with gerrymandering would solve a lot of problems in the House of Representatives. It doesn't solve the Senate problem. The Senate problem is ultimately going to be bigger for this country than gerrymandering because we can only solve it with a constitutional amendment. Uh, if you think about it, uh, in Wyoming, uh, a person gets three electoral votes, uh, and there's, uh, there's 300,000 people less in Wyoming than my congressional district, and each of those people gets three electors. Uh, in my congressional district, you get one elector because you're representative, and then you have uh, two senators, uh, but five uh, House members, so you get another four, so you get 1.4 electoral votes if you live in my congressional district. You get three if you live in Wyoming, and by 2040, 35% uh, of the people in America are going to elect a majority of the United States Senate. 
and it isn't going to be California, New York, Washington, or states like that. It's going to be Wyoming, Montana, Alaska, and all those states. And I, you know, that is a huge uh, potential looming problem. That's part of my very depressing speech, our representative democracy, can it survive? Which uh, uh, perhaps I'll come and give some other time. Thanks very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat>